But I'll tell you what, when I'm done, my biceps are humongous. Humongous. Like that bang. My name is Anthony Bevilacqua, and I'm the host of New York Muscle Radio Podcast. My arms have been a weak point for years. When I started training, my arms measured 11 inches. Even after many years of hardcore training, nothing would get them to grow. With the help of my co-host, Big E, we set out on a mission to gain one solid inch to my arms in 12 weeks. In the greatest experiment of all. 12 weeks later, this program finally helped me get 18 inch arms. The 12 week arm experiment, the ultimate arm growth program, ebook, the audio book, and the workout video. Pick up your copy now on NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. New York's very own muscle building coaches, Anthony Bevilacqua and Pete Kacharian, proudly present to you New York Muscle Radio. What's up, guys? New York Muscle Radio, episode number 123. It's your host, Anthony Bavalacqua, alongside my co-host, Big Pikacharian. And if you're a new listener, welcome to the only muscle-building podcast on iTunes that actually gives out real quality information. Today's topic, what is the diet cycle? Now, I've mentioned the diet cycle um, in other podcasts before and uh, on any other publications. Every time I've spoken, I've mentioned the diet cycle. So, I don't know if I've actually ever defined it on the podcast, so I want to go through and define that today for you guys, explain what the diet cycle is and how you can avoid it. But without further ado, here's my co-host, Big P. Kacharian. What's up there, Hammerhead? Excited to be back, man. I feel like it's been a while since we've done a podcast and more specifically one on nutrition, so it's been a yeah. while. Yeah, man. You know, life is... You know, we're busy. Yeah, we've been crazy yeah. busy. I feel like uh, we've been doing so much work on the podcast, but we haven't put out a podcast. So I'm happy to be back sitting here recording and talking more bodybuilding and fitness. Yeah, I've been busy with the launch of my supplement brand. Again, if you guys haven't picked up your coffee yet, which is my signature product I'm super excited for, you can head on over to buyproteincoffee.com. And I think that was a cool name. Do you, got, pro- uh, do you have... The pumpkin spice coming out? <laughs> nah, I, that would be cool if I did actually, but no, not yet. I feel like sometimes those things mess up the flavor of things. Yeah. Like when you add too much of it. You know, sometimes when you hear pumpkin spice, it sounds like, oh man, it sounds amazing. And then you taste it and you're like, oh, that was a bad idea. I don't think I ever had pumpkin spice coffee, to be honest with you. I've had pumpkin like flavored everything. You know, sometimes they, they come out with the pumpkin bagels even. You know, they got uh, pumpkin muffins. Do you ever taste all the, all the pumpkin uh, Pop-Tarts? Yeah, those are pretty good, actually. Uh, I don't like them. No? I don't like them. No, man. I think they're too sweet. Like, they don't taste like pumpkin at all. It was kind of like when the Quest came out with that pumpkin-flavored oh, Quest bar. Oh, and no, so but The bad. funny thing was the first two or three times I had it, I said, wow, this thing is great. Then afterwards, I thought it was disgusting. What I don't understand is what Quest used to do is they used to actually put in, like, real ingredients in there. Like, you know, the cookies and cream would actually have cookies and cream in it. I mean, pumpkin's relatively cheap. I guess they couldn't put it in there because it's like fresh. I don't know. I don't know. But that was just a horrible choice on their part to do whatever they did with that. Yeah. Well, especially when they reformulated the flavor because then they took one that was already a little bit bad and it just made it worse. I actually had the new blueberry flavor that they came out, blueberry muffin. It was actually pretty good. You know you know what was funny? I was in I was in a vitamin shop the other day and I was looking at the, the protein bars and I always remember that since they changed the new formula, the Quest bars got so hard. You know, and I so I started grabbing the Quest bars and squeezing them. They were like, they <laughs> you're bricks. that dick in the store who goes in and squeezes everything. <laughs> they were like <laughs> bricks, you know. And then I grabbed the the new one, the blue, the, what's it, the blueberry? It's a blueberry yeah, muffin yeah. or whatever. And it was nice and soft. So I said, you know, whatever they did to the new ones, this is the, you know, they reformulated the original ones. Now they made new flavors. So whatever they did this time, I figured maybe they got it right, but I still didn't buy it. It Wasn't was actually pretty good. I, I would say it'd be worth the purchase, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I, w- I would say it'd be worth a purchase. I don't know how we even got into that, but <laughs> whatever, it is what it is. But yeah, we've just been super busy. You know, we were actually featured on the Hollywood Life podcast, which is nothing actually fitness related, but we actually got called to go to their facility in Manhattan and record with them and their podcast. So we'll let you guys know when that one came out, but I thought that came out rather well, even though I think I definitely overspoke my co-host here. Oh, well, you know, it was funny because he was running on uh, caffeine and I didn't have any of that that day. So he, he overshadowed me on that. But actually, that, that was a fun podcast because it was 
a little bit different. Uh, obviously, the, it's a more mainstream audience, so the audience doesn't have as much knowledge on fitness and nutrition. So we did speak about women specifically, but we did it more for the general population. So I think it's a good listen for anybody who wants to hear some of the basics. But it was fun to speak to a different audience. You know, we had to kind of uh, break the science down and make it more practical. You know, we almost were speaking too in-depth about it, and I think they wanted more of uh, just the basics, really. By we, he means him. <laughs> I think I spoke, I spoke rather practical. Yeah, well, you said that. You said that uh, that I was getting too scientific, and I don't, I don't remember that, to be honest yeah. with you. <laughs> Pete was like, you know, yeah, the molecules of the protein you have to get. I'm like, Pete, 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 please, calm down. They don't want to hear about that. Yeah, but, well, you know, that's what happens. Like, like our sponsored athlete said, you know, uh, they talk like bros, but they teach like scientists. They coach like scientists. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I even think that uh, some of the people who hear us for the first time assume that, you know, oh, these guys are just going to give that bro information. Yeah, here's these two jerk-offs here going to talk about nothing. It's nice to have a nice mix, man. I can't hang out with bros for too long, you know? Scientists, I can't really hang out with them for too long either. So it's a nice it's a nice mix, you know, right? Somewhere yeah, right in the so. middle. Well, I mentioned the sponsor, our sponsored athlete, and actually surprised to announce, not surprised, excited to announce, mm-hmm. That our 2017 sponsored athlete search has begun. We've been we mentioned it slightly in the last podcast, and we've been getting emails. And again, we're looking for 10 people looking to get sponsored for this year. We're going to be training you guys, nutrition, coaching, you know, um, obviously training, you know, all for you, all done for you. And we're just looking for 10 people who really want to take themselves to the next level and stand behind New York Muscle Radio completely. Free. So again, if you want to submit an application to us, you can do that by sending us an email, New York Muscle Radio at gmail.com. Just in the subject, just write sponsored athlete search, and we will put you in the running. We actually gonna sit down. I mean, we did this last time, so it worked. What we're gonna do is we're gonna print out all these that we get, sit down in person and just go over who is a good fit for New York Muscle Radio and who's gonna represent New York Muscle Radio the best. Yeah, and this year we're getting a lot of people entering, and we we only mentioned it on the podcast, and we were going to put it up on the website, but the emails just started flooding in, so we're getting plenty of submissions, so anybody who's on the fence about doing it, make sure you get it in, because we're getting a ton of emails, and we're only selecting a few people, so make sure you get it in, and remember, it's a full year of coaching, so you know that's that's expensive, and it's going to be completely free for a full year. Yeah, and it doesn't matter if you want to do a contest, if you don't want to do a contest and just want to look good for the beach, or if you want to do a powerlifting meet, whatever your goals are, New York Muscle Radio is going to help you get there. And again, this is with our sponsored athlete program. Pete, what do you want them to include in the email? Anything in specific? Well, they definitely need to include a uh, current photo and uh, you know, link us to all your social media accounts and basically let us know what your goals are for next year and what you're currently doing right now if you have your diet structured, your training, and uh, let us know why you would like to be a New York Muscle Radio sponsored athlete and what you feel you can offer as well. You know, Just as much information as you want to include. Yeah, and make sure you include – it's very, very important to include your social media. I mean, Pete mentioned it, but I think it's important because it – you know, a lot of people say you're just, oh, what's your Instagram handle? But I actually check that out. I actually go on people's page. I actually look them up. And uh, I just kind of want to see what they're about because, again, you're going to be representing New York Muscle Radio. We're only selecting the best yeah, in New you, York Muscle you Radio. Can, you have to make sure you fit. It's funny. You could you can learn so much about a person just, just on their social media. You know, you could send us a long email and then we could look at your social media and it might – you know, give us a different impression or it might give us the impression we want, you know. So definitely include your social media in there. Well, I'll let you go with the next one, big guy. You're excited about this next announcement. Well, the next one, yeah. So the next one, uh, we're going to announce the uh, seminar. We did mention it on Oh, you idiot. What? Come on, man. You know, we went over this before the podcast. I thought you would, you know, go in order here. (laughs) The pervert inside you wasn't thinking. We have so many things going on. I don't know which one we're announcing next. The pervert inside of you. That's your clue. Oh, okay. I see where we're going with this. Yes, the GLUE program. <laughs> the GLUE program is live. We'll talk about the seminar in, in a few minutes, but the GLUE program is live. We actually put it out right after the last podcast, so we didn't get a, ch- a chance to announce it. It's been live uh, for about a week now on the website, and if you're just listening to this now and you haven't been to the website, check it out, NewYorkMuscleRadio.com, and we have... Glutilicious. 
Yes, that's our signature glute program for you ladies out there. Or if you're like my co-host and you insist on if you're a guy and your girlfriend has pancake ass and you want to improve that, you buy that for her for Christmas and you hand it to her and she'll love you for it apparently. I told you, man, it's the perfect stocking stuffer. <laughs> There's something wrong with you. There really is. <laughs> Although yeah. we don't have it in hard copy yet, so you can't actually put it in the stocking. You can print it out. Yeah. It, it, hey, honey, this is the blueprint to get you a booty. Well, that one was fun to put together, that program. It's actually a lot more in-depth. <laughs> in That's the pervert yes, comment. Yes, yes. No, but it's actually it's a lot more in-depth than you would think. You know, you might say, oh, it's a glue program where they just have you do kickbacks and plyos and all that. Actually, there's not one kickback in the program and no plyos. It's all the good stuff that's actually going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no, uh, no Instagram fluff there. Not at all, no. So again, if- guys, you can head on over to NewYorkMuscleRadio.com, click on that products tab, and you'll see the glute program right there. Okay, now go ahead. Now you well, actually, I, I already leaked it a little bit, so if you want to go ahead with the, uh, no, with no, the seminar. No, no, you go ahead. Well, yeah, so, so as we mentioned it on the, I think, believe it was the previous podcast very briefly, but we now have more details as far as the seminar. So we are going to be doing the seminar live in person. We're going to do it uh, at the end of November. We have the date. It's tentative yes, right November, now. A tentative date for November 20th. Again, the time is going to be to, to be determined. Um, it's going to be at the Lo- East Meadow Benevolent Hall, which is close to us in Long Island, New York. Um, again, the seminar is going to be run by me and Pete, so it's just us this time. We don't have any special guests for this one. But for the next one, if this is a good turnout, we're definitely going to get some big names coming for the next one. But um, should I go over the topics or you want them to go to the page, big guy? What do you think? No, go over the topics. I mean, just, just to note also, yeah, we're starting off small on the on the first one. We kind of just want to get this going for the first time and then – uh, we definitely plan on doing it again, and if you guys want a big name, and if you guys want anybody specific, we'll plan ahead in advance, and we'll we'll get that person on board. All right, so the topics that we're going to cover are, we're going to talk about what your goals are, flexible versus rigid diets, we're going to talk about calories in versus calories out, macronutrients, micronutrients, um, we're going to talk about gaining muscle, what it takes to gain muscle, what it takes to lose fat, nutrient timing, metabolic adaptation, maximizing your metabolism, training for strength, training for muscle growth cardio for body composition, supplements, putting it all together, practical application. We're going to have um, a lesson on the diet cycle, which is going to be similar to what we're talking about today, but a little more in depth. We're going to do a live case study, and then we're going to have Q&As. Again, this is going to be a one-day event taught by yours truly, Anthony Bavalacqua and Pete Kacharian. This is, again, it's going to be a cool thing. Also, um, because we're doing a pre-sale here, the normal price is going to be 300 bucks, but we're also throwing in bonuses. You're going to, for anyone who signs up for the pre-sale, which the pre-sale price is discounted also, um, the bonuses are going to be cracking the flexible dieting code, the ebook and the audio book, which is a $50 value. Um, you're going to either choose from the 12-week arm experiment or the glute program with the audio books and video tutorials, also $50 value. You're going to get a New York Muscle Radio t-shirt. You're going to get a bottle of coffee, the ultimate protein coffee. So that's $175 value. So if you, again, if you guys sign up for that, it's $250 right now. This is the pre-sale price. And again, it's going to be going up to $300 um, once we you know, get a little closer. So again, we only have 20 slots open. So jump on in and grab that. You can head on over to NewYorkMuscleRadio.com slash seminar. If you're in the New York area, definitely recommend coming because if you like what we say on this podcast, you're going to learn a ton more. You're going to basically know how to do everything for yourself. You're never going to have to fire, uh, hire a coach ever again. Yeah. And, you know, my favorite part that we're including in the seminar is the, is the glute instructions. <laughs> well, the, the glute thing, that, that'll that be separate. We might have to do a whole nother seminar on that. Uh, that's done privately in your basement? <laughs> that, yeah, that's separate. I don't know if we could if we could do that in that location, but but um, you know my my favorite part is definitely going to be the practical application part because all these topics that we are going to discuss, uh, obviously, are very scientific and you know pretty much the the, the science will show everything. You know, you, you'll learn how to do how to do uh, everything about macronutrients, everything about training, all about calories in versus calories out. But at the end of the day, it's all about practical application. You know, you could be knowledgeable on all this stuff, but you need to learn how to actually apply it to yourself in everyday life. And just like we were talking about earlier in the podcast, you know, you got the bros and you got the scientific guys. The bros will kind of just tell you everything about how to do things, but have no understanding. The scientific guys will tell you all the facts. But again, there's that element of practical application that I think me and you do very well. And like, you know, anybody who knows us knows that we live this. We don't just talk about it. 
Uh, we've been doing this for years and years now to the point where it's just second nature. So all the stuff that we do talk about, we are going to tell you how to implement in practical application. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's one thing to know all this shit, but it's another thing yeah. to learn how to apply it. You know, it's fine and dandy. Okay, I need to do this, this, and this to to lose body fat or whatever. But, you know, if you want to apply it to yourself and maybe you want to become a coach too, you know, this is the perfect place for you to, to do this. And, you know, it's not... I, I learned so much going to Lane's camp um, only because I was in person with those people. If I would have got – if I would have like watched that same seminar online, it wouldn't have been the same. It was actually going there and hanging out with them and just learning from them. It was more what I learned from them after the seminar and just talking to them that, that made a huge difference. So again, this is something – your chance to meet us in person and hang out and spend the day together. We're also going to cater food. Again, I'm, I don't want to announce too much because it's still kind of early and we got to – you know get all these things in order but you know we're gonna have food and stuff there so it's gonna be a really really nice day and we're excited to have you with us so again head on over to newyorkmuscleradio.com and uh, newyorkmuscleradio.com slash seminar again I probably put this on the home page until it gets um, played out <laughs> but it's gonna be on the home page of New York Muscle Radio so yeah and if any like I've mentioned before if anybody who does want to attend has anything specific that they want addressed when we get there you know any specific topic that maybe we didn't mention or something a specific question email us and let us know because we will work it into the schedule for the day yeah exactly all right so that's all the announcement we have finally um but actually I wanted to ask you did you see what happened with um I don't know I can't think of his name right now because I'm scrolling through Facebook trying to find it the post, the guy, oh man, with the whole supplement thing with the industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, I, I, I think saw, it was prime I, nutrition. I saw it. Yeah. I so saw, wait, what, what was it again? Refresh my memory. Cause okay, I didn't, so I, I can't to remember. Be, the to be totally it. honest with you, I didn't research into it enough to say exactly what happened. But from what I did see on social media, uh, there was an issue with prime nutrition and one of their products. I'm not sure. I don't believe it was all of them. I believe it was one. I believe it was just the intra MD, which was, John Meadows formulated product not meeting the label claims. I believe it was that product in specific. It could be another product. Yeah, it might it was. Be multiple. I believe it was his product in specific. And, um, you know, there was a whole issue with him not getting paid and all this stuff going on with the company. It was a big mess. Uh, but the whether, you know, it's one man's word against another, but the facts that are on the surface is the fact that uh, those products were tested and they did not meet the label claims. So that's really the most important issue there. Um, well, the most significant issue there. And it just goes to show you time and time again that these big supplement companies, I mean, that's one of the biggest supplement companies around, has a product not meeting the label claims. You know, so. It's really it's really scary. You know, I, I'm a personal trainer by, by trade, obviously. And, uh, you know, our clients, you know, online and offline always come to us and talk about, you know, oh, this supplement or that supplement. And, it's kind of sad because they're like, well, what do you recommend? I'm like, well, nothing. Yeah. You know, it's like really, really sad. It's like I can't recommend anything good. You know, and one of the things, you know, having a supplement company now, I, I see the inside of it. I paid extra to have like, a certificate of analysis, you know, um, to check my product, to check the batch, to make sure it meets label claims, to make sure it's safe for everyone to consume. You know, I paid extra for that. And it just goes through. That's a big company. I'm, I'm a one supplement company right. right now one product and i did that i paid the extra to have that done other companies don't do that and it's it's scary it really yeah. is scary well you have to look at it like this and a lot of people don't realize you know you have there's two reasons you know if it doesn't meet the the label claims there's two reasons either obviously the supplement company owner knew about it and he didn't put what he claimed in the bottle and obviously that's not somebody to trust and that's not somebody to buy from or if you know he claims that the manufacturers didn't put what he said in the product you know, what do you do there? Well, if you're a supplement company owner, then obviously you get rid of them, you, you know, file a lawsuit, whatever it is that you do. But if you still work with them, then you obviously know there's something shady going on there. And that's the problem a lot of these companies have over and over again. You know, if it's a one time issue and they fix it and move on, that's a different story. But with these bigger companies, you do see this a lot. And a lot of times, uh, the reason that they do this is there's a huge incentive for these big companies to cut corners because if you're making millions and millions of dollars, but if you change one part of the formula to cut back a little bit and you can double your profits, there's a huge incentive to do it, you know? So somebody like you, a small business owner, you're a one-man crew doing your supplement company, 
obviously you're actually going to put more into it and you're going to make sure that everything is correct because you know like I said if you if you were to cut a little corner it's not going to make you a huge difference in profit you know so there's really no incentive well the other thing too is like with all these companies you know if they're skimping on one product yeah. can you imagine what else they're skimping on I mean I know whey protein there's not a lot to be um not a lot of profit to be made with whey protein so if they're cutting out on their intra carb product yeah, you got to think about it like that. definitely cutting out the bigger stuff. You know, like, yeah. like a carb is a cheaper source of supplement yeah. to produce. That's usually what you like fill whey protein. <laughs> the other products with. Yeah, exactly. So if you're cutting there, you know, you're in real trouble. But this is why you got to try to, you know, buy from people who – and I think this is, you know, not to get political here, but I think this is kind of like, you know, what Trump is talking about with, you know, putting the taxes on people, sending things to China because a lot of these companies get the shit from China and ship it back because it's cheaper here, you know, so – I don't know. Like I said, I don't want to get political, but I really do think that, you know, I see like more of a trend shifting toward small mom and pop locations mm-hmm. lately to kind of keep small business alive. And I think that that's sometimes better. Yeah. I mean, like I said, once you get to that level where you're making so much money and there's an incentive just to cut one little corner and double your profits, you know, it, it just it becomes an issue everywhere, you know. Sad. All right, let's move on to the New York Muscle Radio quote of the day. We got to put insert here, Big Pete. Cool quote of the day music. I don't know let's if see. it'll live up so, to the hype, but we'll give it a try. Yeah, it, it, pro- <laughs> it probably won't as he, <laughs> as he scratches his eyes. So this quote of the day is actually from Pete Kacharian. This is Pete Kacharian's quote. I mean, I don't know who said it originally, but I know I learned it from him, and I like this one. So it is focus, and it says, follow one course mm. until successful. I love that I quote. I forgot. Where's about the that. original person who said that quote? Man, I really, honestly, I forgot. I wish I could give him credit. I didn't say that wasn't me. I did get that from somebody, so I'm not going to take credit for that. But that, I heard it from you, so I'm giving you credit. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that's one of. The, wow, I actually forgot about that. I I must have told you that a long time ago. But it was, it's a great quote because it just it's something that a lot of people don't pay attention to when they try to be successful at something. They start it and then they kind of jump around to something else, go back to it jump around to something else, go back to it. When if you really just focus on one thing until you're done, you'll accomplish it so much faster with with anything. I've I've had this, you know, scatterbrain. I like to call it like scatterbrainness Mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, like different programs. I went on program hopping for a while. You know, I tried this for a little bit. I tried Max LT for a little bit. I tried West Side for a little bit, you know, and it was just, I never followed one of them until successful. You know, I just kind of jumped on one for a couple of weeks and then I was like, ah, you know, forget this. This isn't, this isn't working. What else? You know, and really, I came across something, and I love I love the thing that Facebook does, where it does like the time hop. Yeah. that time hop. It shows you like what you posted. And on this day in 2014, I was coming back from my back injury, not having done legs in like two years, and my max for squats was 315. I have I, I posted a video of my max squat 315. Today I'm deloading. I did a deload squat workout, three sets of one with 435. So it was like it was nice to see that, you know, and and I'm thinking about it now. Like I've I might have sprinkled in a couple of weeks here and there of other programs, but DUP was the kind of the standard training program that I used to get stronger this whole time, and and the results kind of speak for themselves. Man, I didn't think there was ever a time in history when you had a max 315 squat. Dude, I didn't squat for two <laughs> years. Two years. It's a long time. Not that doing is a long at time. All. You know, what's funny when I I took off a period of time from training legs about that long maybe about a year and a half almost two years and i came back and my max was <laughs> right around the hit too but the fact is before i took that time off it wasn't much higher than that <laughs> you know what it is though with squats i think one of the most things is i watched the video and I, I watched i was like wow that was really easy i definitely could have went more the problem is it's just getting used to having the weight on your back that's definitely one of the things with squats that uh makes it so difficult to come back quickly yeah, and a lot of it's just relearning the movement pattern. If you haven't done it with heavy weight in a long time, it just becomes a very awkward movement. A lot of times you're actually still stronger and you could handle a lot of weight as far as you know the, your strength levels, but moving it through that range of motion becomes very awkward. And it's a very technical lift, so if you get out of the groove even at one point, you know you could fail on the lift. So that was today's quote of the day. Follow one course until successful. So again, guys, if you pick up one of our products, you know, let's say it's the arm experiment. Make sure you follow it through 100% and until you're successful, until you get that one inch. And then run it again and see what happens. You know, you have to follow one course. Try to, If you're following our arm program or our group program and then you see, you know, something on Instagram of someone else's arm program or someone else is doing this for their yeah. glutes, 
and you try to shift and do that and add that into our routine, it's not going to work. Follow one course until successful. And I, I love that quote because it was so mind-opening for me, eye-opening for me. And uh, yeah, I, th- I thought I would share it with you guys today. Yeah, and I mean, that just that goes for anything. I mean, even if you're not doing something optimally, but you still follow through with it, it might take you longer and it might not get you there as fast or as easy, but you'll get there if you still stay with it. That's the biggest thing. You know, even if you have a program that you're on that's not optimal, if you're tra- trying to grow your arms, the arm program is that. If you're trying to get bigger glutes, the glute program is that. But if you're not following those programs and you're just doing what you think is the best thing to do and you stay with it long enough, you'll see results. It might take you twice as long to get there. But you still get there, you know, so if you want to make sure you do things efficiently, have the right program and then follow it all the way through. All right, guys, we're going to do the shout outs, our New York Muscle Radio shout outs. Again, guys, if you want a shout out, you can head on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash New York Muscle Radio. So today's shout outs, Nathan Ferreira, Diane Rome, Romero Bonella, JR. Oh, my God, I feel so bad. I butcher everyone's names. JR Aluzu, Alzu, Sebastian David. Brad you just Hoffman. skipped over that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jeremy Slate. He liked our he, the guy. You know, Jeremy Ryan Slate from the last podcast. He he's a New York Muscle Radio listener. Um, Granny Mears Bullen, St- uh, Stephen Little, Ben Simpson Dohiri, Eric Holowicki, Patrick Rooney, Luz Chu, Gina Marie, Nicole Lassini. All right, guys. Again, you know what I noticed about our listeners? We don't have like a a, a, a Michael Smith. I know, of course. You know, <laughs> you know it's going to be the time when you read it that it's going to be all Michael <laughs> Smith, Wendy. You know, it's going to be like easy names. We don't have any of them here. No, I, I got to always butcher people's names. And again, I apologize for that. But that's this is New York Muscle Radio Podcast. That's what we do. All right, let's move on to the listener question of the day. Again, if you guys have a question you'd like us to answer, you could submit it on our website, NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. So let's listen to question. And actually, he asked for a shout out. So I'll do it before his question. So shout out to Matt Ryan, not the Falcons quarterback. He's a principal of Newfield High School, and he actually has a question. He emailed us, so I'll read the question out, and uh, we'll, we'll answer it for him live. So, dear Anthony and Pete, first of all, I'd love to have a shout-out on your podcast. That was already done. This is by far the cleanest and most trustworthy muscle radio program I listen to. I've literally binged on over 40 episodes in five weeks. Keep them coming. Let me give you a little background. I'm a new high school principal who is working with our athletic coaches to instruct our students our student athletes about getting bigger and stronger using the JACT program. Also, it doesn't hurt that I work out with my students using the same program. We are at week four deload, which is great, but I have a couple questions that relate to the whole program. So this is good. It'll, it'll help everyone who's on our JACT program. Given in the week one to four deload section, you make specific reference to reducing the weight to 60 to 70% of your five rep max. As a starting point, what percentage of our three to five rep max weight should we be using for our, our hypertrophy training? Also, I see the guidelines for power slash performance section as it relates to a 10, 8, and 6 rep max, respectively, between weeks 9 through 11. Is there a general rule for gauging your 10 rep max as a percentage of your 3 to 5 rep max? Any help with this would be incredible. In addition, my plan is to work with our students on creating macro plans utilizing the flexible dieting ebook as a reference. Keep up the good work, and I can't wait to hear your future episodes. Sincerely, Matt Ryan, the Falcons quarterback. Um... So I, I should back up a little bit. So he's talking about the Jack program, which is our free program that we give away on NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. If you go to that products tab, you'll find it in there. It's our free program that we give away. So that's what he's referring to. If you don't know what he's talking about, head on over there now and download it now. So you want to you want to answer his questions, that big guy? So you the, back the, it up? the first question, um, I caught it really quickly. So he was asking about percentages, right? Yeah, as a starting point, okay. what percentage of our three to five rep max weight should we be using for our hypertrophy training? Okay, so yeah, so you have on your power exercises, you're using stuff like your three and your five rep maxes. Now, the hypertrophy exercises, you really don't have to get specific with percentages because hypertrophy work, the goal is not specifically to lift a certain amount of weight. Uh, the more important thing is getting the volume in. So you want to pick a heavy enough weight that you get all the sets and reps in while avoiding going to failure on the first set. So let's say you're doing something on one of the hypertrophy exercises might be three sets of eight to 10 reps. You want to save failure for maybe the last set um, because you want to make sure you get 
all the reps in across the board with the same weight. So generally, as a good rule of thumb, let's say you're going to do three sets of eight, you might use something like your 10 rep max with that. You don't have to pick a certain percentage or anything like that. Depending on the day, you might be able to go a little heavier. Maybe you're a little burnt out. Maybe you need to go a little lighter. The key there is the volume, getting all the sets and the reps in. But you don't want to go too light. That if you know if you could do 20 reps with it, you're not going heavy enough. All right. So the second question is, is there a general rule for gauging your 10 rep max as a percentage of your three to five rep max? That's kind of tough to answer because for everybody, that's a little bit different. You know, if you're basing things off your one rep max, a certain percentage might allow you to get about, you know, eight to 10 reps with that. But as far as what you can lift uh, with it, with your three rep max in relation to your 10 rep max, that's different for everybody. You know, there's some people that can do really heavy weights for three reps but they can't do heavy weight at all for sets of 8 to 10. You know, there's a significant difference. Other people, their 3 rep max and their 10 rep max might be very similar. So um, there's really no formula for that, to be honest with you. That's more about just being in tune with your body and knowing approximately how much weight you could do for 10 reps and using that weight. I don't know if, yeah. you, have, I don't know if you have a guideline you would use to, to do that. I'd say for basing a 10 rep max off a 3 rep max, a percentage is probably not the best way to go about it because it's going to vary too much. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I really don't know. Is there a general rule for gauging your 10 rep max as a percentage of your 3 to 5 rep max? I think what he's I asking. Think he's, I think he's referring to hypertrophy as uh, um, training too with that. Yeah, I think. But, but the thing is, you know, if you're training in those rep ranges 8 to 10 and you're doing the hypertrophy rep ranges, you don't have to worry so much about using a specific percentage of your 1 rep max. Yeah. You know, you want to focus on that on your strength training, your power days. Uh, because you do want to be working in a certain percentage of your one rep max to increase your max strength. You know, you're gonna increase hypertrophy just getting in enough volume, but strength is specific. So you need to be lifting in a specific range of your one rep max to improve strength. All right, Matt. Well, I hope we answered your questions, and you know, thank you so much for introducing this to high school students. Because then again, I wish my first of all, I wish my yeah. <laughs> gym teacher in high school knew what he was talking about. But uh, I think it's cool that you're a principal who's active with your students and you're p- setting them up on a, on a great road down the line and they're going to get stronger and bigger and leaner and it's going to be awesome. They're going to be starting out on the right foot. So thank you so much for using our program for that. We really, really appreciate it. And it's a really humble experience in knowing that. Yeah, he's going to have an entire high school weight room benching at least three plates by the time they graduate. Hey, man, listen, like I said, I wish my gym teacher who taught like – Jim actually knew what he was talking about. You know, this is the principal of the school. Right, Matt right. Ryan, he's also the quarterback of the Falcons too. So he specifically wrote that in the email. That's why I keep saying that. Wrote, <laughs> yeah. Matt Ryan, not the Falcons quarterback. So I'm just reiterating that it is the Falcons quarterback. All right, guys, we're going to take a short commercial break and we'll be right back with what is the diet cycle? What's up, New York Muscle Radio listeners? It's your co-host, Big P. Kacharian, and I'm glad you're all listening. Put down that tilapia and asparagus. Learn how to get bigger, stronger, and leaner eating what you want. Pick up a copy of Cracking the Flexible Diet Co. exclusively at NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. But for now, let's get to the show. Hey guys, it's your host, Anthony Bevilacqua, and I just wanted to announce that my brand new personal training facility is now open. I'm currently taking on new clients in the Long Island, New York area. If you're interested in working with the best personal trainer in the business, head on over to abfitnesstrainer.com and sign up for your free consultation. Then you can understand why bodybuilding.com has named me personal trainer of the month. All right, guys, we're back. New York Muscle Radio, episode number 123, 123. Today's topic, again, what is the diet cycle? Now, again, we've mentioned this several times on the podcast, and I think it's cool to actually go in a whole podcast on what the diet cycle is because so many people go through this, whether they're a competitor, whether they're dieting down, you know, and even the average person who goes on a diet goes through this. So I think it's good if we define it for you guys and just go through the phases of it and explain it a little more in depth. So again, I'll give you the quick definition here. The definition of the diet cycle. Um, You're basically starting a diet. You're going through a phase of restriction. You're going through a phase of deprivation. You're going through a phase of craving. You're going through a phase of giving in and you're going through a phase of guilt and then you're starting the diet all over again. So again, we're going to like kind of define these and you know, whatever. So pretty sure most of you have tried other diets before and you deprive yourself of what you wanted, binge, gain weight back. This is basically called the diet cycle. 
Yeah, and unfortunately, I'd say how, how, what percentage of people you think start a diet suffer from this whole cycle? 98%. Yeah, I was going to say about 98, 99%. I actually, I actually think the statistics show like we don't, as a society, we don't have a problem with losing weight. We have a problem with keeping the weight off. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's crazy because it's just, you know, it's not only that they, we have trouble keeping it off, it's we have trouble not gaining more of it afterwards. Yeah. And I think a lot of it, you know, obviously when you start a diet, it all begins in the mind. You know, you could be yeah. in the best diet in the world, but if it doesn't fit like your life or your way of living, you're you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. You have to get yourself mentally right before you start the diet. You know, a lot of times if you just jump into it and you, you really don't think about it or commit to it, you know, commit is definitely the better word for it you're going to go through this diet cycle and ultimately you're going to set yourself up for failure. So it's about committing to it and you know, you're going to experience the stuff that we're going to talk about, but it's about making the right decisions and not just giving into it. Cause that's what most people do. They give in when things get tough and you know, it, it's all about, you know, if you, if you want something, making sure you commit to doing it rather than just starting and seeing how it goes. Cause that usually doesn't end up too well. Yeah. And guys, if, as we explain this is if, if this sounds like you or you went through this situation you know, it's totally normal so that you have nothing to be embarrassed about. I went through this. My co-hosts went through this. And it's just kind of putting a name to what happens. And I think once you acknowledge all this happens, you can kind of set yourself up for success in the future. So, again, let's just get started with this and roll with it. Phase one of the diet cycle is when you start the diet. Again, this is the start of the diet. You're really, really motivated. You know, let's just say you're coming off of a bulking phase and you're, you've gained weight. And uh, you're beginning your diet. You're so excited to lose body fat because you can't take eating anymore. You know, you're just mentally ready for this phase. Yeah, I mean, that's the best way to describe it. Yeah, everybody starts off a diet uh, motivated, you know? The beginning of the diet phase is always strong. Okay, I'm going to start off strong. I'm going to get my gonna get my meals prepped. If you do that, I'm going to get all the, the groceries I need, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose X amount of pounds by this date. I'm motivated, you know? That's how everybody starts off the diet. I don't think most people jump into it saying, oh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do well. Most people do start with some confidence, which is good. It's a great way to start the diet. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, usually at this point you're very excited. You've, you've come off a of bulk or whatever you've come off of and you're just ready to diet. And it, I think this is the perfect time, you know, when uh, and you, right now whatever you're doing is brand new. So you're, you're like really excited. You know, that, and this is where like for the normal person, you know, they start like a, a random diet, you know, the uh, Atkins diet or South Beach diet. This is where it begins. You're like, wow, you know, this is going to work. you you're so full of confidence at this point. I would say this lasts for a good four to six weeks. Yeah, Maybe that, longer depending on how severe the diet is. Well, for some people, it's four to six days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first day. Yeah. I, always, I always used to explain to you know clients in the gym, you know, Monday, everybody starts off so yeah. motivated. You know, Tuesday, everyone's good. Wednesday, they have a little slip up, but they know it's okay. Thursday, they're half good. Friday night comes, they go out with their friends, they're like, oh, you know, one meal won't hurt to have one meal. Saturday, they start out the day good and the whole rest of the day goes to shit. Sunday's completely shit and then it just starts right over again. Oh, well, that's how it is. I mean, you could even see it in the gym. You know, Monday's always the most packed. Tuesday, they're still going pretty strong. Wednesday, nobody's in the gym. Thursday, yeah. Thursday, you get a couple people, they come back like, oh, shit, I got to get back on it. And then Friday, they're just like, fuck it. <laughs> Actually, oddly enough, I know a statistic because when I worked in the gym, we I used to analyze this stuff. Um... Wednesdays was actually one of the busier days in the gym. Go figure. Interesting. The, actually, Wednesday was the day with the most check-ins. I don't know. I don't know how that. I get what you're saying because when I used to be in the gym, I never used to understand that because Wednesday was always like more dead than the rest yeah. of the days. Monday was always packed, but they had always more check-ins on Wednesday. Interesting. Maybe a lot of people come in just to do cardio on Wednesday. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? All right, so let's move on to phase two. So phase two. So again, I would say anywhere between four to. Four to eight weeks, again, depending on how heavy you are, what your body fat is when you start versus what it ends up being when you start dieting. But the phase two is the restriction. So this is the point in any diet when your body fat drops below your set point, a point in which your body fat level is comfortable and lo lower than your body likes, or when you just feel too restricted, which believe it or not is actually really normal. So yeah. this is the point where you actually start to feel like restricted. You know, you feel like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore. I really want to eat. You know, this is yeah, kind th of the, that, that point in your diet where you're like, why am I doing this? Yeah, this is where it becomes mental, you know. It, it's definitely physical at this point. You know, four to six weeks into a diet, you're going to be feeling it. You know, it all depends how restricted you are, but you might not even be overly restricted. But just the fact that you've been consistent with it for so long, 
it starts draining you of energy, mostly mental energy, you know, because you're thinking about it all the time. And eventually that builds up. You know, if you don't relax and just follow, follow through with it and, you know, just go through the process, you're going to stress yourself out and the diet's going to kick in and the stress is going to kick in. And when you hit this, you know, this four to six week mark, uh, this is where a lot of people who aren't mentally tough, you know, I use that term, but it, it doesn't really mean what it sounds like. I'm not saying like, oh, you got to be mentally tough to follow through with the diet. You just have to be emotionally stable with it and not give in to cravings and give in to temptations and just, you know, give in to the fuck it feeling. That's, you know, the best way to describe it because a lot of people get to that point where they say, oh, you know, this is starting to suck. So fuck it. I'm going to eat, which is, you know, what happens a lot of times. Well, I guess that'll lead right into the next one, which is um, phase three, which is deprivation. So the, the deprivation state is where you begin to feel sorry for yourself for dieting. You get frustrated mm. in your results up until this point, which leads us to crave things we normally don't eat. And I remember when I dieted for my first bodybuilding show, I hit that point where like your body fat was like really low, and I was craving things that I don't normally yeah. like eat. Like I like I was never into sweets as a kid, but I wanted cookies, cake, anything I knew, you know, that I wanted. Yeah, this is when you start taking an, some type of like. It's almost like it's behavioral issues is really what it is. You know, like it's stuff that you normally you start behaving in ways that you normally wouldn't. And it's all due to the, the to the diet for long term, because like you said, I've had that experience myself, too. I'm not really a sweets guys, a sweet guy. You know, like if, if I if yeah, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, that's not me. <laughs> but, you know, like if I'm craving food, the last thing I crave is a piece of cake or like ice cream. You know, I like ice cream, but it's not something I crave when I'm hungry. I just like to eat it. But when I'm dieting. Ice cream sounds like the greatest thing in the world. Cake so- sounds like the greatest thing in the world. And a lot of that, like you said, it's almost just like you're feeling sorry for yourself. I, I don't yeah. have, I, I'm not allowed these foods, so I want them. Exactly. So I think that the restriction phase and the deprivation phase also kind of, they're into kind of twine, but mm-hmm. I think that there's definitely a, a stepping stone between the two because I know when I'm in the restriction phase, I feel it like, ah, man, you know, yeah. like I just, I, this is not, and deprivation phase is really like a little more deeper in the diet where you really start to feel sorry for yourself. You're like, oh, why am I doing this? This is like, this is like this, the, the low point in the diet. You right, know? right. Like well, you my, know what it is during the restriction phase too? You have to look at it. You know, no, nobody does this, but I think the longer you do it, you'll start to do this. When you're in that restriction phase, you have to look at it. You could turn it into a positive and you could look at it and say, you know what? I'm feeling it. So I know what I'm doing is working because obviously that's why you're doing this. You want it to work. So it's not going to work without you feeling it. That just comes with the territory. You know, if you want to lose body fat and you want to look good, you're going to have to go through periods where you feel hungry. You're going to have to go through periods where your energy levels are low. So if that's not happening, you're not going through that period, then what you're doing is probably not working. I'm not saying you have to suffer, but you're going to go through periods where you're not going to be feeling comfortable. So, uh, you know, if you're not if you're not willing to do that, then just know you're not going to get the results that you want. Yeah, and I mean, you know, this also comes back to the type of diet you choose too, you know, mm-hmm. but when you feel really deprived like that, this is why we practice flexible right. dieting. This is why it's something that has worked for both of us. This is why I was able to log in on my fitness pal for a thousand and fifteen days because I am I do not restrict anything that I eat. I just have to fit it into my calories. So this is why, you know, we, we wrote Cracking the Flexible Dieting Code, which is our signature ebook, which you can pick up on New York com slash products. But um this also helps with this phase, but even if you're still doing that and you're you're getting to the point where your body fat drops below your set point, you're really going to feel this regardless yes. of the type of diet you're on. But cr- flexible dieting helps big yeah. time. It, you know what it is? If you're in a deficit to the point where you're losing the correct amount of body fat in the correct period of time, you're going to feel it regardless, but there's the psychology component to it as well too because if you're in a deficit – and you're losing weight, you're not going to feel good, you're going to be hungry, your energy levels are going to be low. But at the same time, every time you eat, it's boring, bland food. You know, you have to eat that chal- that tilapia and asparagus, the chicken and broccoli. I thought you were going to say chalupa. <laughs> well, you can eat a chalupa if you practice flexible, fle- <laughs> flexible, flexible. dieting. <laughs> flexible dieting. You know, so that's where flexible dieting comes into play because, yeah, you're, you're, you're depleted, you're hungry, you're losing body fat, but you know what? Uh, I'm kind of craving some pizza and I want to have a slice of pizza or I'm, you know, craving a little bit of ice cream. I could fit that ice cream in, you know, so it makes the process more enjoyable or at least less shitty, you know. So that's where sticking to it becomes a lot easier because, OK, I want to lose body fat. I want to lo- reach my goals, but I can still stick to this because I could have that ice cream. I could have that chalupa. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, this is, this leads us into phase four, which is the crave phase. 
this is, you know, here's where it really begins. And again, if you don't stay strong and stay the course, you're going to start to give in to all those cravings. You know, these are the ones where the late night binges may happen. You know, the closet eating and any form of eating disorder actually starts to occur mm-hmm. because you get to that point where you feel so restricted and so deprived and you just, you have that, that fucking moment. And you're just like, ah, I, I'm done, you know? But you got you to gotta remember too that like binging doesn't solve the problem because right. you're still not going to feel good. You'll feel good while you're eating it, but then you're going to regret every second after that. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, this is something, and this comes from experience, you know, because I've been there, we've all been there. Uh, not only does the binging not help, but the fact is, if you're doing, if you're binging because you want to feel better, if you're saying, you know, my energy's low, I'm starving, I just don't want to feel hungry anymore, my energy's, I want to get more energy, and you go and binge, that binge is not going to help your energy, it's not going to help your hunger. All that's going to do is satisfy you for about 5-10 minutes. Uh, you might feel full temporarily, but your body's been in a deficit for weeks on end now. You know, one meal is not going to take you out of the deficit. One meal is not going to get your metabolism revved up. It's not going to get your energy levels back. So what's going to happen is you're going to eat that meal and, you know, how severe it is depending. Uh, if it's so severe that you actually start to lay down a little bit of body fat and, uh, you know, you, you lose a couple of days, weeks worth of progress, that's all you're going to do. You know, and then you're still not going to feel well because the only way you're going to feel better after being on such a long deficit is slowly increasing those calories over a few weeks at a time, getting your body back to, you know, having higher calorie levels. So that's only something that can be fixed uh, over the course of a few weeks, you know, even post contest. I always used to think after I competed, okay, I just want to go home and eat for two days and I feel better. Hey, even if even if I did that, I didn't feel better maybe for about a month after the contest, sometimes two months, you know? So reverse dieting is really the best way to go about it. You know, at this point too, you may be you may be feeling frustrated kind of with your progress too. You may be feeling like, oh, uh, you know, I'm dieting so hard. It's been so many weeks into my pro- into my diet. I should be losing more. And I think everybody goes through that. It doesn't matter yeah. if you're you could be losing two pounds a week, you're gonna want to lose three. It's just the human nature, it's how we are. So you're going to, at this point too, you're going to be feeling very, very sorry for yourself. You're going to say, you know yeah. what? Fuck this, man. And you crave everything. You'd be craving things you never would have thought. And this leads us to phase five, which is actually the give in phase where you actually start to binge. Again, this has happened to everybody. I know bodybuilders who, you know, real OCD bro bodybuilders who have gone through the same yeah. feelings that we're talking about here. And what they've given into was cans of tuna. Like they, they, <laughs> yeah. they were just so, you know, whatever. And they just had extra cans of tuna. I mean, granted, that's better than having like ice cream and cake. But still, you still give into it. You still blow your diet just because, you know, you're just feeling so bad for yourself, you know? Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, like you said, this is human nature. Um, you know, people who do this more often, more long term, you know, myself and Anthony, if we were to go on a very long contest prep, we can sustain a very long period of time before we get to this point you know this we'd have to really suffer for a very 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 long period of time before we actually did this just because we're, we're so we're just so used to doing this actually I'm gonna, I'm, to. Gonna, I'm gonna cut you off you're 100 mm-hmm. percent right mm-hmm. um the only thing was when i was bro dieting so that means if i was following you know whatever type of a diet um you know whatever chicken yeah. and brown rice or whatever I hit this phase, these phases Way a early, lot right? faster. Yes. Yeah, on that. It took yes. me like 12 weeks to get there. Whereas, you know, with flexible dieting, it would take me, you know, seven months. Right. I agree 100%. Because like you said, you're still able to eat those foods. So psychologically, it doesn't drain on you as much, you know, when you have, when you practice flexible dieting. But the fact is, it's human nature and you will get to that point. If you restrict yourself for long enough, for everybody, it's a different period of time. Like I said, somebody who's more mentally tough, somebody who's got more experience doing this, It'll be much longer, but the fact is that's human nature, and you're going to get to that point. And I've seen so many people, and we've worked with people too, who are excellent, on point, their diet 100% of the time throughout a whole contest prep, whatever it is. And they will eventually, maybe after the contest, when you know what, there's incentive to just go into fuck it mode because yeah, exactly. you know what, the con- the contest is over. I you did you did a hundred percent, you did a hundred and ten percent of what you were expected. You might have won your contest, you might have exceeded what you were expecting, and you know what, the contest is over. So you have two options. You know, you're at the point now where you just want to give in, or you know, you could take a little bit of a better approach, but you know what? There's not so much of an incentive to do it because the contest is over. You did what you accomplished. And most of the time, these people will give in and they'll start doing at least modified binges. They might, you know, I, I'll tell them to yeah. oh, eat eat what they want for dinner, but it might turn into two or three days. It just happens. Exactly. You know, so it, 
you're not alone. Everybody does get to this point. It's just a matter of how long it takes to get there. Yeah, and how long you rebound from it too. Because, you know, like, like you said, you know, you're at that point, your diet's over. You know, maybe you did a contest or whatever. Maybe you got in shape for the beach or wh- whatever you're trying to get in shape for. You're at that point where you're at where you're at and you're like, all right, I'm done. And you just kind of go on off the deep end. You know, you'll quickly find yourself, you'll make your, your before picture look like your after picture. Yeah, it's very true. And a lot of times it's, Harder to recover from that than where you first started getting yep. into shape. So, yep. you know, you got to be careful what you do, especially after a long diet. The longer the diet, the more careful you have to be afterwards with binge. Exactly. Yep. So phase six of this cycle is the guilt phase. And this guilt period can last one binge or up to three weeks. This is where you're going to feel horrible for your, about yourself, horrible for what you did. And, you know, you're just feeling so guilty. I mean, this can happen in a meal. You know, have one meal and you just feel so guilty after that. But... This is the whole phase where, like I said, it could last one binge or it could last up to three to four weeks where you just feel so bad for yourself and like, ah, oh, man, look how good I look. You look at pictures of yourself from before and you're like, oh, I was so ripped. What did I do? I can't believe I did this to myself. And what happens? You shift right into phase seven and you start all over again. It's crazy because, yeah, the last part of the phase just gives you incentive to start from the first phase all over again, you know? So it's something that it, it – Basically, it turns into a vicious cycle, you know, and that's yeah, and this, this is what I call the diet cycle. You know, this is where th- it happens. It's so normal. It happens to competitors. It happens to normal people. But how how do we solve this big guy? You know, what do, how do we go about preventing this? I mean, we mentioned it in the podcast a little bit, but how do we solve this? Well, the biggest thing is you got to start off correct from the beginning. You know, that's always going to help you no matter what you do, starting off correctly in the beginning. So when you start off a diet, and we've talked about this more particularly to when you start like a contest prep diet, you have to know what you're getting into. And I think people listening to this, uh, you know, we, we explain basically what they're getting into. So at least that's good. That's a good place to start. You know, okay, these are the things that are going to happen because most people that I speak with, that you speak with, that we speak with together... Um, when we first start them with a diet, they go into this pretty blind, not knowing that these things are going to happen. Maybe they, people haven't been on a diet ever in their life. So they just assume, okay, I'm going to get hungry and that's going to be it. But there's, you know, this comes in phases and they, they get worse and they build upon each other. So knowing, okay, if you start the diet in the beginning, it's going to be a little rough. You're going to be a little hungry, uh, but it's going to get a little bit tougher unless you know what you're looking out for. I think starting off with that mindset Knowing, okay, I have to take it day by day and I'm going to go through these phases of highs and lows. But if I stay consistent with it, I'll get to where I want to be. And knowing that the process is not going to be easy. You know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to suffer. That's the other misconception, I think. A lot of people think that they have to start out suffering. In the beginning, you don't have to suffer. You know, if you're trying to get to contest levels of conditioning, you're going to suffer, you know, towards the end. But in the beginning, you can lose 10, 15 pounds and it might be a little bit of a struggle, but... It's nothing the average person can't handle. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and you said it perfectly, you know, where you don't have to struggle right out the gate. And a lot of people just assume that, you know, they want to jump yeah. on a diet and they start out low carb. You know, that's not really the, the best approach. You're going to be end up suffering. You're going to go through this cycle a lot faster if you do that. If you were, whereas if you were to start on like a flexible approach and start with more food earlier on, you wouldn't feel this way until you got really close to your goal. Again, the other thing too that I want to touch on you know, how else we could solve this is reverse dieting. Because once you get to that point of where you reach where you want to reach, if you slowly start reverse dieting, you can maintain that level of leanness that you achieved reverse dieting. So this is why reverse dieting is so important. And we also talk about this in Cracking the Flexible Dieting Code too, um, maximizing your metabolism because something you have to do before you even start dieting is really ramping up those calories and really forcing your body to be able to handle more food. Yeah, and I mean, I tell the average person this too a lot of times. They always want to know. You know, get this question all the time. You know, people first start uh, working out. Maybe they want to put a little bit of muscle on and they want to burn a little bit of body fat. And they always say, okay, you know, I have a little bit of extra body fat, but I'm, I don't have a lot of muscle on me. Like, what should I do? Should I bulk first and then cut or should I cut and then bulk? In most cases, it's really a good thing just to get that fat off and then maximize that metabolism because then from there, if you're just trying to look like a good per, like if you're just trying to look good. Uh, you're just trying to look like a good person. Yeah, you know, if you want to appear as a good person but really be a scumbag, <laughs> you know, but if you're just, if that's your goal, if your goal is not competing on the stage, you just want to look good, you might want to have a beach body, getting that body fat off, then maximizing that metabolism, 
you can look like that year round, you know, and not have to go through a dieting phase again. You know, you could eat high, higher calories and keep that body fat off. Whereas if you start out trying just to lose weight and then you go through this cycle where you're just constantly trying to lose it, lose it, lose it, you're just you're going to end up gaining more weight. You know, and that's usually what happens. So going through that phase where you do get that body fat off, then maximizing that metabolism, that's a great place to start because then from there, it, it's all maintenance, you know. And if you're somebody that is already in the process of bulking, you know, and you're eventually going to cut, maximizing that metabolism is also a great thing to do because then from there, when you start that cut, you can keep those calories higher and you don't have to start off suffering. That's the biggest yeah. thing too because if you don't do that, unfortunately, some people have to start off suffering because their diet's already very low and you don't want to do that. And most cases... When somebody comes to us and they are in that position already pretty low in calories, we speak with them and we let them know, okay, you know, if you spend a little time getting that metabolism back up, then we could drop you into a calorie uh, restricted phase and you will burn fat on higher calories. Yeah. I mean, you know, the other thing to, to know too is that this happens to everybody. You know, we mentioned this before, but it, it happens to everybody. And I think once you go through it once, you learn, you hopefully you learn and you take it away. So the second time you die, it's a lot easier. You know, because you, you know what to expect. But this is why I wanted to, I want to bring this out to everybody, and I want to talk about this more the diet cycle because this is so important to understand that everybody goes through this, and when you get to that point where your body fat does not want to go down anymore, where your body's at that point where it's comfortable with the body fat level, it's going to be a lot harder to push the envelope, and you're mm-hmm. going to have these feelings more and more and more. The leaner you get, the stronger these feelings are going to be, and that that sense of like feeling sorry for yourself is going to happen yeah. because you're going to be feeling like shit. The leaner we get, the more like shit we feel. This is why I think everyone likes being a powerlifter now because everybody <laughs> could everybody could lift heavy and uh, eat whatever they want and be happy. You know, a dieting bodybuilder a couple weeks out from their show or uh, someone who's close to their vacation weight or whatever, they're usually not as happy as when they started the diet. Yeah, and I mean, if you're if you're looking for a way to to work with that, you know, like it's, it's basically bodybuilder psychology. I mean, if you associate progress with that then at least you know you're on the right track you know bodybuilders and i I could speak from experience when i have competed in bodybuilding shows when kind of my bodybuilding switch was on uh you know when i would go through those periods where i felt extreme you know extreme restriction extreme just just being burnt out all the time being starving being hungry i associated that with me making progress because the truth is that when you're losing that much body fat you're going to feel like that so I didn't look at it in too much of a negative way. I associated that with making progress. So it's a good tool to use. Most people won't use it because most people just don't like to feel good. And, you know, they say, well, I feel like shit. There's no other way around it. But the fact is, if you kind of trick your mind a little bit and focus on, okay, if I want to lose body fat, I know I have to feel this way. And if I feel this yeah. way, I know I'm on the right track. Then, you know, you're doing the right thing. It's reinforcing a positive behavior rather than a negative thing. Exactly. And I know for me too, one of the things that triggers it is I start to feel sorry for myself, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I know whenever I start feeling, I have to like shut that off immediately. Like, all right, don't feel sorry for yourself. You're doing this for this amount of reason. Don't worry about it. And again, I think this happens more so after you reach your goal too. You know, when I dieted down last year, I was contest level conditioning for powerlifting. Um, I was, you know, obviously during the diet, you're motivated. It doesn't even bother you. It's more after that. You always have a little harder time, you know, rebounding from it. You're like, you know, well, I, I can have a little bit more. You start to ra- you start to almost yes. rationalize things a little bit more. Like, oh, I can have a little bit more carbs here because it doesn't matter. You don't have that pressure of the event coming up in the background anymore. But if you just stay tight, you can maintain a lot of that leanness. It's, I'm telling you, I think that reverse dieting is a lot harder than actually going through the physical phase of dieting. Yeah, I agree 100% because it's more of, you know, just convincing. It's more of when you're dieting, there's no convincing yourself. You know, you've made a commitment that I need to lose this amount of weight by this time or I need to get to this level of conditioning by this time. So this is it. We have to do this. You know, afterwards, you're kind of balancing every single day. Okay, is this worth it? You know, can I just eat a little more if I gain a little body fat? What's the big deal? So you're constantly struggling with, you know, deciding if it's worth it or not. It's, you know, because there is no, there's no deadline. There's no specific end goal other than, okay, you're trying to maintain your body fat levels while increasing your calories. So Mm -hmm. it definitely can be more difficult. I mean, at least psychologically, that's for sure. All right, guys. I mean, do you have anything else you want to add to that, Big Beat, before we close this out? I think we we mentioned 
quite a lot on that, and most of it all comes back to psychology. Like you said, you mentioned a lot of times. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I think it's physical. I don't think it's. it's I don't think it's all psychological. Well, no, you should, know, once your body, once your body starts, quote unquote, starving. Yeah. I, I don't think that's psychological anymore. No, you will. You will start taking on new behaviors because of your body is being so restricted. So that's definitely physical. Um, as far as the decision making process, more more along the lines of that, when you start yeah. feeling sorry for yourself and stuff like that, and you know binging and all that stuff a lot of that's just psychological you know a lot of times people want an easy way out they want to feel comfortable it's it's human nature in the moment they want to feel comfortable in yeah. the moment because even if like we mentioned even if you're at that low point in your diet where you're, you're you're at your leanest and you binge you'll feel good for that time and then that's it after that yeah you go right back to how you felt before that the biggest thing is we can tell you that and you can understand it but until you actually do it you're not going to actually internalize that because you're going to say you know what they said that, but I'm still going to binge anyway. I don't think I'm going to feel that bad. I think I'm going to feel good. And then you know what? They do it. And they say, you know what? Those guys at New York Muscle Radio, they were right. But you know what? You have to experience it. That's how you actually understand it. Exactly. All right. So again, I'm going to sum this up for you. So what the diet cycle is, it's the psychi- psycho- psychic cycle of dieting. So you start the diet. You go through a restriction phase where you feel restricted. You go through a deprivation phase where you feel so bad for yourself. You start to crave things. You give in to those cravings, then you have that huge feeling of guilt, and that huge feeling of guilt could last, you know, one meal up until weeks, and then you start dieting all over again. This is called the diet cycle. Again, this has happened to so many different people, competitors, normal people, um, you know, anyone you could think of has went through this cycle at some point. So how you avoid this, you have to stay strong mentally, have to understand that your body's going to go through this, you know, this process, and this is a process, and that you're on the right track if you feel this way. Yeah. And you just have to learn to steer clear of, you know, cra- giving into the cravings and those feelings of guilt. And if you do happen to slip up every once in a while, it's okay. Just hop right back on the, you know, the, the horse right after that. Don't let it spiral into weeks yeah, and weeks. Yeah, that's that's the biggest thing too. Because if you do slip up and you have one cheat meal, you binge for one meal, it's not going to do that much damage. Yeah. You know, and you could hop right back on, and you know, in some cases, it does nothing. You know, I, I don't exactly. want to encourage that, but in some cases it does yeah. nothing. It's when you say, oh, shit, I, I binged. Fuck it. I'm just going to keep eating. Yeah. That's when it's that's when, you know, there's no coming back or at least you know, and I, I use the example hard. of I use the example of this in, you know, during the week, you know, Monday through Saturday, yeah. Sunday. And it, it's exactly the same cycle. You know, you start to by Sunday night after eating whatever the hell you want to eat, you start to feel good. And you're like, All right, I'm going to start tomorrow. That's, and that's usually yeah. how it lasts until weeks and weeks and weeks. So, again, guys, practice flexible dieting because that will help you. Um feel less restricted and less deprived it'll also help with your cravings because if you're craving something you could fit it in so definitely stick with that um practice reverse dieting after you reach your goal you know try to have as much incentive afterwards as you do during the diet to stay on track and i promise you you will have a leaner more muscular physique if you just listen and understand what happens during the diet cycle all right big guy your turn Pete and Anthony, New York Muscle Radio, and we're out. Enjoyed this episode of New York Muscle Radio? Make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave us a five-star review, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, New York Muscle Radio.